Today we're going to talk about leaf diseases on hemp and um, let me minimize this. And, and so we're talking about leaf diseases uh, primarily because that is the number one thing that I get questions about. Um, and I know there are a lot of other diseases, but leaf diseases seem to be what people see and those seem to be the, um, the, the calls that are generated. So we're going to talk about leaf diseases today. All right, so first of all, what is a disease? I want to make that very clear. So as a plant pathologist, I refer to disease as a, an abnormality of the plant caused by some microorganism like fungi, bacteria, viruses, water molds, nematodes. Those are, those are what I consider to be disease agents and the cause of disease. Okay, um, we can sometimes um, call abnormalities disease that are, that are actually not caused by plant pathogens. Those could be insects and arthropod pests, and you'll hear from Dr. Villanueva later today. Uh, sometimes even abiotic or non-living things like environmental issues, uh, mechanical issues, the weather, um, plant stress, those things would cause disease-like symptoms. Those are not exactly diseases. So. There's a difference. So when I talk about disease, it's specifically um, abnormalities caused by plant pathogens, period. So um, as we go through, I just want to kind of make that clear. All right. So types of diseases. So first of all, disease is simply a symptom. It's a plant's reaction to whatever that microorganism is. So um, not all leaf spots are caused by the same thing, for example, right? Just like we as humans, when we get sick, if we have a fever, if we have a cough, it's not always the same causal agent. That's the symptom. That's our body's way of reacting. Well, the diseases are plant's way of reacting. So when we talk about disease, that's not a confirmation. A confirmation is when we look deep into, um, in, into the microorganism and determine what that is. Okay, so types of diseases. Uh, we've got leaf diseases like leaf spots and leaf blights. We've got root rots. Crown rots, the crown, by the way, is right there at the soil level. So um, southern blight, for instance, would be a, leaf, uh, would be a, crown, a crown rot. Uh, stem cankers, and a canker is a woody stem lesion or a woody lesion. So a stem canker might be something that would happen on the stem, um, the, trunk, the trunk or the stem or a branch. And then, of course, head and bud molds. I'm not going to talk about head and bud molds today. Again, we're talking about leaf diseases. But I just want to give everybody a heads up that we, are, we, we have some studies in the, in the works. We're looking at head and bud molds. We will be discussing that um, probably next time you see me or I'll be uploading some things onto the website. All right, today we're talking about leaf diseases. Um, here in Kentucky, there are three primary leaf diseases. Um, and, and I want you to be able to, to differentiate them. And I want you to be able to differentiate them. Um, I, I, you know, we, we live in a world of social media and I follow so many social media sites and there are all these keyboard diagnosticians who, who are spouting off um, assistance for their uh, fellow hemp growers and telling them what things are. I mean, even some of the big, um, the big cannabis books or sites you know, they're even, they've got misinformation out there. So we need to be very careful. I think hemp more than anything else I've ever seen has a lot of information out, disinformation, misinformation out there on the web. Be very careful, okay? Anything from here on that you're diagnosing, make sure there's an actual lab that does it and there's an actual plant pathologist doing it. Every state has their own system. There are private labs, there are university labs. But um, looking at pictures of symptoms and listening to, um, like I call them, keyboard diagnosticians is not the way this is done. So, um, they, and there are reasons for that. We'll talk about that along the way and some of the repercussions of having a wrong diagnosis. All right, so off of my soapbox and back onto my topic, um, our three top leaf diseases, hemp leaf spot, which some people are calling bipolaris leaf spot, uh, caused by a fungus called Bipolaris gigantea. Uh, we called it hemp leaf spot for a long time because we did not know the causal agent. Cercospora leaf spot. Any of you who grow any other kinds of crops know Cercosporas. So we have a Cercospora leaf spot that's very common in, um, 
in, in hemp and septoria leaf spot that probably gets the most attention. Um, and we, we've recently been working on that one and recently identified that as septoria cannabis. So let's break these down one by one. Hemp leaf spot or bipolaris leaf spot caused by bipolaris gigantea. Um, what we know about this pathogen, so this is a this is a fairly new revelation. It took us quite a while to, to nail this one down. Uh, but bipolaris comes in around mid to late July as temperatures get hot. Um, symptoms will start in the upper canopy or small uh, tan to brown spots. They remain small. Uh, sometimes the centers fall out or they'll cause like a frog eye or shot hole symptom. And those spots will coalesce, meaning there's necrotic or dead tissue that connects those spots. But by looking at the lesion, you'll be able to see individual spots and you never lose that. So the spot doesn't get very large, but um, a foliar uh, the, the blighting of the leaves, that means quick death, this kind of brown and crispiness. And then of course, a uh, blighting of the entire plant is very common. We're seeing less severe blighting as the years go on. Some of the cultivars that we've seen in the past that were the um, most susceptible have kind of gone by the wayside. And some of the newer cultivars that I see growers using these days are, um, you know, they're, they're more tolerant. So we'll see hemp leaf spot, but we don't see this entire blighting or, or our entire crop loss. Um, so that's a good thing. Now, in terms of identification, proper identification, what we know about bipolaris gigantea, that it's primarily a, um, a disease of monocots or, you know, grasses, rice, barley, banana. Um, we've never seen it on broadleafs ever until we started seeing it on hemp. And now we're seeing it on a handful of broadleaf weeds in the field. And what we think is happening, um, we think that um, the green bridge are some of these broadleaf weeds, like hop hornbeam copper leaf. I see it there the most. So knowing, again, that identification, proper identification, lets us know what those alternative hosts are and, and how we can manage weeds, for example, that maybe help reduce our, um, our disease um, severity. So optimal conditions for this pathogen, we don't see it until it gets hot and the weather becomes rainy. We don't see it in the spring, even in those alternative hosts, even in those weed hosts. We only see it again in July. Sometimes it's even into August before we see it. So this is a late season disease, probably overwintering in debris. Um, I'm pretty sure about that. We have studies going on, but it's probably overwintering in debris, just like a lot of the other bipolaris uh, species do. Here are some close-ups of the bipolaris um, uh, disease, hemp leaf spot. On the right, you'll see that's a severe disease. You'll see the spots and the centers falling out. And on the left, this is what I want you to be able to do. You should, by the way, all own a hand lens, a jeweler's loop. You can get them for $5 online. Um, if you can't squint, a big magnifying glass. I use those sometimes. Uh, but this is a close-up of a leaf spot. And you'll see those black dashes in the center of that spot. Those are conidia forests. Those are the stalks that hold spores up above the leaf surface. And you can see those. You can see them with the naked eye. Hence the species named Gigantea. This is a very large spore and a large conidia for. And uh, so you'll see they're scattered. There's only one per plant cell. So they're scattered. And again, you can see these. And I want you to be able to look for these because this is how we're going to differentiate this disease from another one. All right, moving on, Cercospor leaf spot. Um, this, this leaf spot, um, again, the literature and, and the uh, folklore that's out there has been telling us for a long time that there are other Cercospors causing Cercospor leaf spot in hemp and cannabis. We have seen Cercospor flagellaris only, and so have our colleagues in Ohio and Florida and other states. So consistently, we've seen it to be Cercospor flagellaris. Um, Cercospora flagellaris, by the way, is one of the pathogens that cause purple seed stain in soybeans. Uh, we see it a lot in um, grasses like Johnson grass, um, Asteraceae hosts, a lot of our weed hosts, Asteraceae, uh, amaranth, we know amaranth is what? pigweed and some of the other amaranths that are out there. So this is another, this is another ubiquitous fungus that has a um, pretty wide host range in terms of weed hosts. We'll start seeing Cercospora leaf spot late in the season. This one doesn't really come on until September or October. 
um, we'll see a lot of blighting, again, that quick death. And that's what you see in the photo here of the sugar leaves. And the sugar leaves are those leaves that are within buds uh, or within the, the head of the uh, plant in the reproductive um, region. Um, the spots are pretty asymmetrical, so they're not round. And they'll have distinct purple borders. What we know about Cercospora, uh, any scientists out there, Cercospora, the fungus, produces a toxin called Cercosporin. And it's a phytotoxin. It, it's a toxin to the plant. It's not toxic to humans, but that cercosporin toxin causes that purpling. All right, so wet seasons, of course, hot, wet seasons is what this pathogen likes. If we have a rainy summer or rainy fall, we'll tend to get cercospora uh, a little bit more. Um, what I've seen is all of our cultivars are pretty much equally susceptible, but if you have a low-lying area where humidity builds up, any of your leaf diseases are gonna be pretty severe. So if in a holler or in a low spot where there's, there's um, not good air drainage or airflow, we'll see a lot more. And that's usually where cercospora pops up. Um, Cercospora flagellaris will pretty much overwinter in debris, uh, but some of these um, other hosts uh, will come in earlier. So we'll be able to find it on some of our weed hosts earlier, but it really doesn't take a hold on hemp until later in the season. And here is Cercospora up close. On the left, there is that leaf spot and with that purple, um, purple margin, that broad purple margin. Sometimes we'll see a yellow, a narrow yellow halo around there. On the right, that is, those are the um, canidia fours. Those are those little stalks that are holding up uh, spores. And you see they're in little clusters of five or 10 or 15 canidia fours per plant cell. And that's the difference. Remember I showed you the bipolaris had single canidia fours per plant cell. These are in little clusters. And if it's really wet, or if you put, for instance, a, a leaf in a Ziploc bag, and um, it has some moisture, then that will continue to sporulate and they'll look like little fuzzy balls because there's so many of these little tufts, um, these canidia fours coming out um, in, in one little tuft. All right, so our third and final disease is septoria leaf spot. Um, septoria is probably the most common of the leaf spots in the last few years uh, caused by septoria cannabis. Um, we, we pretty much struggle to identify this one. We know it's not any of the other septorias, those that infect um, tomatoes or blackberries or any of the other crops. Septoria are pretty host specific. So um, cannabis would probably be its only host. We're still working on this one, uh, but septoria cannabis, the one that's in the historical literature, we think we've, we've matched it morphologically and we're pretty confident about that. Septoria comes in early. We'll start seeing it in June and July, pretty severe by the time July gets here. And if we plant in June, I, I, we're pretty much seeing Cercospora in very early uh, vegetative growth stages. Uh, Septoria starts in the lower canopy to inner canopy, um, and it will move inside that inner canopy. We rarely see it in the outer canopy or those leaves that are exposed directly to sun. It likes a lot of humidity and that's what's happening in the lower and inner parts of the plant. We've got the humidity, especially as we get some rains and that soil is wet, we're seeing that humidity build up there. Um, one thing about septoria, it's very distinct, is that the irregular spots, meaning they're not round, and they are bordered by a very bright yellow halo, I'll show you in the next slide, um, and those yellow, those yellow regions will expand very rapidly and then leaves drop really fast. So leaf, leaf drop is, is quite startling to a lot of people. Um, occasionally, it will extend to later in the season, but not always. If it gets dry, it pretty much slows down and shuts down. So cool or wet weather, when it gets hot, it pretty much shuts down. Um, what we're guessing about septoria cannabis is that it's overwintering in debris. Um, we don't know if there's another host. It would be logical that there might be another host out there because where else would it come from? We see it in, in fields that haven't seen, um, that haven't seen uh, hemp or cannabis in many, many years. So where is it coming from? We're guessing there's another host. So here's septoria leaf spot up close. Um, on the right, you'll see those irregular spots and you'll see that bright yellow halo around them. And on the left, uh, you'll see those black dots in the center of the, um, 
of the spot, those are called pycnidia. They're like capsules that are holding spores. And that's one way that the pathogen will overwinter. It makes it drought tolerant, heat tolerant, and fungicide resistant. So each of those capsules, each of those dots is like a capsule about the size of a black pepper flake, and it will hold about 30 to 60 spores. All right, so in summary, and I can paste this for you in the chat box, um, septoria leaf spot happens first, and that's the one that'll cause leaf drop in the inner canopy. Um, hemp leaf spot is uh, later in the season, around mid-July. We'll see it even in the upper canopy or in the entire canopy. It's not restricted to the inner canopy. Cercospora leaf spot, we see it primarily on the sugar leaves. It can be other places, and it's very late season. So um, I'm leaving you with this. Um, Research-based information, absolutely critical. Scout your fields. You have to know what you're looking at. We have resources out there. Get a hand lens or a magnifier of some type. Confirm your diagnoses with a lab that has a plant pathologist on site, not, um, not a web, um, not website um, identification and know that every state has its own regulations about labs and about moving plant material around. Please, if you're out of state, do not send um, your plant material to me, it is illegal. And of course, maintain records when these diseases come in, which cultivars, keep a logbook and take photos along the way. And in closing, as we manage disease, um, disease specific recommendations, it matters which disease you have. Um, it, it, it matters which one is if we're going to try to manage it all. Sometimes we're not going to manage it all. Um, there is cultivar susceptibility um, out there and there is a little bit of tolerance uh, per cultivar. Um, alternative hosts like weeds really matter in a lot of these leaf spot diseases. Air circulation and um, we just don't know yet about biocontrol fungicides. Um, we're not real sure. We haven't gotten there yet. Um, we have some greenhouse studies but we just don't have anything yet in the field to make recommendations. We're working on all those things. I'm gonna put these in the chat box, some references for you. Um, we will continue as our field research data gets um, analyzed. We will get some new, um, we will get some new um, resources up on our website.